Kukrumah Media's Polity Amtabi Madiba. Joining me today is journalist and author Nick Dahl and writer and publisher Matthew Blackman, here to unpack their latest co-authored book, Legends, People Who Changed South Africa for the Better. So the book tells stories of a dozen remarkable people. Talk to us more about the inspiration behind the book. This is the third book we've written together. And our first book, Rogue's Gallery, detailed 350 years of corruption in South Africa. Our second book, Spoiled Ballot, looked at how democracy, after getting off to a pretty good start in South Africa, we had a multiracial democracy in the Cape in 1854, went backwards. The, the framing of those books was about the bad stuff in our history. But while writing them, we realized that despite all these, these bad things that were happening, in every era in our history, there have been really amazing people who've tried to make the country better and, and in many cases succeeded. So we decided to flip the whole narrative on its head, focus on the good stuff for a change. I mean, South Africa really needs some good news at the moment. There's a lot of moaning and grumbling going on. And we just thought, you know, we've got a few centuries worth of proof that South Africans are incredible people, and we continue to be. I mean, we've got one living legend in the book, Tuli Maronsela. There could easily have been more. So, yeah, that, that was the inspiration for the book. And, I mean, it was a complete joy to write, just reminding ourselves of all these incre incredible people and learning more about their lives. And Methy, can you tell us about how you went about selecting these legends and what criteria was used? So when we talked to people about this book um, initially, people said, oh, well, uh, the good people of South Africa, that must be a very short book. But by the end of it, we had at least 50 names down um, and then we had to make some kind of selection. So the first criteria was that we wanted to tell the history of South Africa over and we didn't want to repeat the same stories. So we, like with our other books, we, we wanted a continuous narrative across our historical landscape. So th that was the first one. Then there were certain people who we were both sort of wedded to that we, you know, that for, for me, there was Sol Plaiki and Olive Schreiner who just had to be there. You know, I, I've, I've done a lot of work on them over the years and you know, they had to be there. For Nick, there were also some people who had to be there. And of course, you know, Mandela had to be there. But as far as the themes were concerned and the themes that the people brought out, there is one There is one person who, who maybe doesn't quite fit this, but they all had to in some way have a progressive life. They had to move from the position that they were born in, quite often one of discrimination or whatever the case is or hardship or whatever and they had to progress past that and um and also be inclusive in their attitudes towards the people around them so um and that's one of the most remarkable things about i think all of them is that friendship and communication played a huge part in all of their lives they all i think had a desperate need and want to communicate with other people in south africa and they all, to a greater or lesser extent, formed these quite incredible friendships with the people around them. And their friendships were cross-racial, cross-gendered relationships. And I think that those, those were the important fundamentals for us. Then there were a, a few crossovers, like, you know, somebody like Tutu and Mandela. We thought that might be telling the same story or... Um, Walter Sisulu, we really wanted to write about him, but his story and Mandela's story would have been too similar. We would have been telling the same story, essentially, with a lot of the same moving parts to it. So there were people that we had to discount on that level, but we have left literally 50 or 60 people out of this book that we could have easily written about. And that's, uh, you know, must be in some ways, hugely encouraging for our country that there are so many amazing people around. But hopefully we'll get an opportunity to write another book um, along similar lines, and we will we'll include those people, particularly, I think, Tutu and Susulu um, are two people that we're really eager to, 
to write something about. John Fairbairn brought non-racial democracy to the Cape in 1854. So, Matthew, can you tell us about why the political position he took provoked some serious heat and quite often hatred? So, yeah, I mean, Fairbairn was one of those liberals who seemed to have evoked hatred from both the kind of right and from the left. So, Fairbairn, when he arrived in the Cape, initially um, fought for the free press. And he evoked the wrath of Lord Charles Somerset, who threatened to have him arrested and banished and various things. But, um, you know, he took on many of the fights that I, I guess what we would refer to as human rights issues. So he fought against slavery and he made various arguments against why he believes slavery to be wrong, one of which has been picked up by certain left wing historians who say that he he made the argument that it was economically inefficient to have slaves. But he did, however, also argue that it was completely immoral to have slaves, that to own property, for man to own property and man, as he put it, was, you know, a moral issue as well as a purely financial issue. But so he tried to argue two, two different arguments for slavery, and he seems to have evoked a lot of hatred for having having done that on both sides on, you know, the, the, the Dutch farmers at the time absolutely loathed him for trying to end slavery. And there is some questions about, you know, why he promoted the idea of its economic inefficiency so highly. But I think it was an attempt to convince the Dutch farmers that they would be better off without slaves. Then he also fought for a non-racial democracy, which was extremely controversial at the time initially with the Dutch farmers, but also particularly with the British colonial powers. So he literally sat in the middle of all of these arguments. And, you, you know, he is, I think what really does make him incredible is that, you know, he persisted his entire life with fighting these fights that were incredibly unpopular. And yet, somehow he managed to get his way you know, he he brought about almost single-handedly in, in the end, the free press. There was the end of slavery and also the non-racial democracy brought about in 1854. So he did win all of these fights in the end, but he was quite often and on two occasions attacked and brutally beaten. And there was a rumor in, the eight, in 1849 and 1850 that he would be murdered and that the colonial powers would be behind this murder. So um, he lived a very interesting life, and he, and he won seemingly all his fights that he had with the establishment, and yet he's almost entirely forgotten, which is, is quite strange. And Nick, can you talk to us more on why you quoted Nelson Mandela as the last great man when other people feel he sold out? Yeah, I mean, so we, that's a, a topic we, we tackled uh, in the book. I mean, I think, interestingly, of, of all the 12 legends in the book, Mandela is the one who we give the hardest time um, because, because he sort of looms over our history as the biggest figure in our history. We decided to write a slightly longer chapter to go a bit harder against him, and, and he still stood up to the test, in, in our opinion. So... Um, I think with Mandela, there are a lot of factors at play. I mean, one is that he led an extremely long life. You know, he didn't die at the age of 30 like Steve Biko. He died in his 90s, having been through many phases. People forget that Mandela was a revolutionary. He was the guy who came up with the idea of MK. He he founded MK. He He wore combat fatigues. You know, he was a proponent of the armed struggle. Richard Stengel, the guy who ghost wrote uh, Long Walk to Freedom, talks about what the Santa Clausification of Nelson Mandela. You know, most people remember him as this white haired grandpa who was always smiling and, you know, having tea with Betsy for Wood and that kind of thing. Um, but he wasn't always a Santa Claus. In terms of the, um, the people who accuse him of being a sellout, he definitely did make a lot of concessions in the lead up to 94. But I mean, the angle we take is that if he hadn't, 
we, we probably would have lurched into civil war. I mean, it, it did come very close on a few occasions, most notably after Chris Harney's assassination. So, um, yeah, I mean, we, we decided, you know, that maybe he made some concessions that were, were overly generous and, you know, he was the first to admit that he made mistakes in his life. Um, but I mean, over such a long life, he got a lot more right than he got wrong. That That's what we feel. And Matthew, can you tell us how Sol Plagi built a community that managed to traverse diverse communal boundaries in a bid to create a South Africa in which citizens felt enfranchised? Yeah, I mean, Sol Plagi is really one of the most fascinating human beings South Africa has ever produced. You know, what is important to know about him is that he grew up in the Cape Colony where he had the vote. He, in in his Mafeking King diary, we know that he voted in the 1898 election and that he voted against Cecil John Rhodes at in um, Barclay West. But he grew up in, in on a mission station quite near actually Barclay West, quite near um, Kimberley. And it was quite a diverse community that he grew up in. And the two people who in many ways brought him up were two German missionaries who educated him and um, taught him music. And, and then he actually went on to teach their children how to read, which is quite an interesting little aside about his life. But he then went to Kimberley, which again was a quite a diverse community. Um, and the one element that Plyke had to an extreme was the ability to make friends. And he made friends with some of the most unusual people. For example, he became very friendly with a man called Henry Burton, who would ultimately become the first minister of native affairs. He also traveled to England, where he befriended a whole group of women in the suffragette movement. Um, and he always believed that negotiation and reaching out to people on a on a human level would ultimately win over the, the racism that existed in South Africa. And it wasn't that he was, you know, in some ways, it seems that Plyke is almost oblivious to race. He certainly wasn't. He was very firm in his beliefs that this racism that was an inherent part of the South African condition had to be stopped. But he went about it in some of the most extraordinary ways. He he was a, a journalist who wrote, I mean, some of his journalism is absolutely beautiful. He wrote the first novel by a black African in English. He was really, you know, the first politician to try and bring together all of the various communities in South Africa and was obviously one of the founders of the ANC, which was a quite a unique piece of history, certainly within Africa, of um, what Pixley Semmer and him referred to as multi-tribalism, bringing all the people together under one umbrella to fight corruption. So, And Plyke was a fundamental part of that. So he was an incredibly unique and, and really wonderful human being. And whenever I read about him, I read him with such affection. He is just such a such a kind, gentle and wonderful person who had this remarkable ability to just make friends with almost everybody he met. And Nick, can you tell us more about the contributions that Tulima Donzella, the book's only living legend, made to get her included on the list of the remarkable South Africans? Yes, um, we were sure we wanted to include a living legend in the book. Um, and we had a few options. Um, I won't uh, give any spoilers away because we might write another book. But um, eventually we settled on Tuli Maroncella just because she, we really thought, you know, because the problem with it, you're writing about a living legend and, and they're still living, so they might, they might mess it up. Um, and then your book will look a bit stupid. And and with Tuli, we just felt really, really confident that she wouldn't mess it up. So, I mean, everyone remembers, you know, what she did with Nkandla and what she did with um, the State of Capture report and the way she just 
gracefully, graciously, but extremely steadfastly stood up to everything the state could throw at her. You know, I mean, she didn't just do what she knew was right. It wasn't easy to do that. You know, there were there were obstacles coming up left, right and center, delays, smear tactics, uh, trip wires, you know, all sorts of things. And she, she just navigated that beautifully and with such poise. What fewer people are probably aware of is that, you know, she didn't just arrive in 2007 as this fully fledged, you know, public protector. She had to get to that point. You know, she had a remarkable younger life. Just graduating as a lawyer was an achievement, you know. I mean, the circumstances she grew up in made it difficult. Her father, her priest, both advised her against being a lawyer, but she stuck to her guns. And then as a lawyer, she did some remarkable things. She helped to write the Constitution. She, um, way before it was fashionable, was fighting for gender equality and, and doing it in a really strong and convincing way i mean there's a there's a beautiful um she wrote an academic paper just after 1994 you know in the new south africa where she said you know we can't talk about gender transformation if all of the government the main positions in government and like she was talking about sort of more civil servants than the actual politicians or if, if the positions are mainly occupied by men and particularly white men. You know, this is post-94. And, that, that, and she included a cartoon in this academic paper, which is another thing. You know, she had a sense of humor, which she still has. Um, and this cartoon shows a bunch of old, white, balding men sitting around the boardroom table. And, and the caption says, we'd better include some sort of gender commission. Um, so, and then after her you know, tenure as public protector, she has continued to fight for her belief that the constitution of South Africa can deliver the country we all want. She um, she participated quite a lot in this book with, you know, she she was interviewed by us and she she read drafts and stuff. And she told us that she said to me that constitutions are not magic worms. They don't just come to life. You need to actively fight to make them come to life. And as she's the head of social justice at Stellenbosch University, and they're doing some incredible things there to to build a better South Africa. So yeah, it, it, she was an easy person. You know, once we just settled on her, we had no doubts that she was the right living legend to include. And Nick, can you tell us how Miriam Makeba defied the odds of a township upbringing to become an international singing sensation and human rights ambassador in the 1950s? Yes, I can. I mean, I think in, in some ways, Miriam Makeba's story is the most remarkable of the 12 in the book. You know, everyone knows Pata Pata uh, and a few other songs, and, and she had a great stage presence. But there's just so much more to Miriam Makeba. Her life if ever there should be a Hollywood blockbuster made of a South African's life, it, it's Miriam Makeba. When she was about two weeks old, her mother was imprisoned for brewing illegal beer. So Miriam Makeba spent the first six months of her life in prison. You know, I mean, it doesn't get worse than that. She didn't have a good start to life. Um, so she, she became a domestic worker and her first um, employers accused her of stealing and the police came and, and the husband eventually talked the wife out of, of laying a charge. Then her next employers took her down to Durban and insisted that she collect shells for the uh, the madam to, to use in arts and crafts. And while she was collecting shells on Durban Beach, the police arrested her for prostitution because why else would a black woman be on the beach? You know, this was the world she lived in. Um, but she she overcame these odds for one reason and one reason only. She had a remarkable musical talent. She couldn't just sing incredibly. She had the stage presence. I mean, Hugh Masekela, who, who ended up marrying Mira Makeba briefly, saw her when he was like 12 or something, just performing and he said that everyone was in love with her instantly. You know, she just had this amazing way about her. 
so she um the way she she became an international singing sensation is is quite remarkable she she appeared in a musical called king kong which has also been forgotten it was an absolutely huge production the biggest musical production south africa's ever seen i think around 200 to 250,000 people went to see it most of them white but also black uh, which is quite interesting to me and then after that that wasn't actually the thing that got her internationally known um she appeared in a in a, a another show called African Jazz and Variety which was an attempt to showcase the incredible music going on in the townships to white audiences and one of the people in the audience at one of the shows was an american filmmaker who was making a film an anti-apartheid film called Maibuya Africa um and he just was mesmerized by Miriam Makeba as everyone was and he put her in his film and he then managed to get her out of South Africa because the apartheid government weren't keen on on black South Africans traveling and he took her to the Venice Film Festival and she was an instant hit um not only because of her singing but she she was so ahead of her time she didn't straighten her hair she didn't wear makeup she you know she was a natural african woman and he after the the success of um the Venice Film Festival he managed to get her to America and within days she was on tv uh, on one of the talk shows and as she was walking out to to sing on the talk show the host said to her good luck miss makeba uh, there are only 60 million people watching and uh, apparently she she says she nearly fainted you know she she had no idea that i mean that there would be so many people watching but her nerves didn't show and and she became a household name in america and she was really close friends with some huge names in history um Sydney Poitier Martin Luther King Marlon Brando Nina Simone these were her, her buddies and Harry Belafonte was a big big influence in her life too the thing about Miriam Makeba is she didn't leave it at music she um appeared in front of the United Nations Special Assembly General Assembly four times after Sharpeville twice and after Soweto twice to to decry apartheid so in, in some ways she was one of the loudest critics of apartheid because she she had this platform and and she used it uh, wisely but then the, the story doesn't end there because she she married um a guy called Stokely Carmichael who was one of the black power people he was quite close to Malcolm X and she got cancelled in America that that he was too radical for their liking they were happy with Miriam Makeba as a musician but Miriam Makeba as as a left wing activist was too much and so Miriam and Stokely moved to Guinea in West Africa where she lived for quite a long time and and had to reinvent herself she she sang in a lot of the african newly independent african nations and in europe and um she did eventually get to come home to south africa and to to live in a free south africa which you know it was it was a beautiful story and lastly matthew what are you hoping people take away after reading this book so you know i i hope the key takeaway of it is that we have remarkable people who have in many ways led us out of some terrible situations that this country perpetually seems to be going down these these avenues um but there are people that have led us out and it should give us confidence for the future to know that these people existed and that they are still amongst us um you know i hope it also and this is a slightly grander hope is that um that some of the politicians out there might take inspiration from some of the lives in in this book and realize that divisive and dividing politics has never worked in South Africa and the people who have made this place a better place are those that reach across political and racial and gender divides and that is really you, you know in many ways why why we wrote this book to to show what a remarkable 
country we are. We have a lot of problems, but we can overcome them if we look to each other. And and there are people amongst us who are capable of leading us out. That was Nick Dahl and Matthew Blackman speaking to Criminal Media's Polity about their book, Legends, People Who Changed South Africa for the Better.